on behalf of the Manchester International Law Center, um, the Garden Court North Chambers and the Accountability Unit, along with the Justice Hub at the University of Manchester. We're just absolutely delighted uh, to get to share this time together uh, this evening. We're going to be talking about the crime of crimes, personal and legal reflections on genocide. The format uh, will be that uh, Pete will uh, introduce the speakers for about five minutes. We will then have a keynote by Dr. Raymond for approximately 10, followed by Dr. Furman and Dr. Lopian, each speaking for about 15 minutes on personal reflections, followed by uh, Arif and uh, Kate Stone, each for 10 minutes on legal perspectives. After that, we will um, have a group discussion which will have two different formats, but at that time I'll share uh, with you how we're gonna be doing that. Uh, and that will go for about 15 minutes and then another session for about 30 minutes. Okay, so uh, nothing else to say there. Uh, Pete Weatherby, would you like to take over? Thanks very much, John. Um, I'm Pete Weatherby, I'm a barrister at uh, Garden Court North Chambers uh, and I'm equally delighted to co-host this with the University of Manchester and the Accountability Unit. And this is going to be a first of a series of um, seminars um, on international law. Um, genocide is uh, called the crime of crimes with good reason. Um, some years ago, I, um, just let me mute my, Yeah. Some years ago, I, um, uh, 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 having understood academically what genocide was, I uh, did a case which tangentially um, involved the Srebrenica massacres and had to um, research in, into it. And I, I reflected on what it really was at that time. Uh, and it, the mass killings uh, of entirely innocent people, horrific enough, uh, wasn't it isn't genocide. Genocide uh, is the uh, ultimate um, personal crime of murder committed over and over, over again, but also with a coherent, organized policy element to eradicate a people. And that's, at, of course, at its heart. Education and remembrance is vital uh, and we meet today, 25 years on from Srebrenica, uh, a crime, of course, which was co itself committed 50 years on from the Holocaust. So, of course, again, as I'm sure you all know, this is the uh, uh, 75th anniversary of the end of that particular period of atrocity. And the fact that Srebrenica was allowed to happen on European soil 50 years after the attempted eradication of the Jews by Nazi Germany is, of course, a shocking feature that should have called us all to arms. Uh, and of course, other um, um, uh, genocide that we're going to come on to uh, should do so also. Uh, if education and remembrance is vital, uh, so is law and the struggle for an end to impunity for further crimes against humanity and particularly the crime of crimes, both by effective international and domestic jurisdictions. Only by ending impunity do we have a chance of preventing further such uh, outrages. The word genocide coined in 1944, a crime under international law uh, by the General Assembly in 1946, codified in 1948 with the Genocide Convention effective for 1951. The naming and codification of genocide was, of course, a signal part of the international response to the Holocaust. And its preeminence recognized by the uh, Genocide Convention being the first human rights treaty adopted by the General Assembly. But of course, genocide preceded its naming and its definition. Uh, acts committed with the intent to destroy a national, ethnic, racial or religious group predated and regrettably postdated the 20th century. Two of our eminent speakers, Dr. Noemi Lopian and Dr. Leila Furman, 
are going to relate their own personal legacies relating to the Holocaust firstly uh, and to crimes perpetrated against the Yazidis of Iraq and Syria uh, in contemporary times. Uh, to follow, uh, Arif Abraham, convener of the Garden Court North International Team, an acting director of the Accountability Unit, will speak about the law of genocide, its difficulties in its application. And Kate Stone, also a member of the International Team at Garden Court North and an executive committee member of the Bar Human Rights Committee, will conclude with lessons to be learned from both legal and personal perspectives. However, to start, I'm really pleased to introduce Professor Javed Rayman, the UN Special Rapporteur on the Human Rights Situation in Iran, member of the Coordination Committee of the Special Procedures United Nations Human Rights Office, author of International Human Rights, a seminal work, um, and an associate member of Garden Court North, and in his spare time, a professor of law at Brunel. Javed is going to start us off as to why a discussion on genocide is as relevant today as it was after the Second World War. Uh, and then, as you've heard, once uh, the speakers have finished, we're going to have uh, a, a period of 15 minutes taking stock in small groups, and then we're going to reconvene for Q&As. So uh, can I, with that and uh, no more, hand over to Professor Raymond, please. Thank you. Thank you, Pete. Uh, dear colleagues, this is a great pleasure and honor for me to be invited to speak to you on this highly challenging yet important subject. I begin by thanking the organizers for this organize, for the organization of this event and indeed for inviting me to speak to you this evening. Genocide, appropriately termed as a crime of crimes, is undoubtedly a practice of antiquity. Examples abound of this practice, including the horrifying massacres resulting from the Assyrian warfare during the 7th and 8th century BC, the Roman obliteration of the city of Carthage and all its inhabitants, religious wars of medieval and indeed modern history. Then there is uh, the evidence of large scale massacres extending to the wiping out of entire indigenous communities. Genocidal acts were conducted in evidence in the process of colonization, but the progression of decolonization and emergence of new states and nation building projects have also resulted in serious acts of genocide. Apart from a few isolated in instances and amid acquisitions of victor's justice, there has been no impartial objective or comprehensive accountability for gross genocidal acts. Notwithstanding this horrific account of genocide, its facets remain imprecise, and there has been a deficiency of understanding of the phenomenon, both generally and also amongst lawyers and jurists. So how did the modern understanding of genocide evolve? And let me spend a, a few minutes on that. Ironically, uh, it was, as has been mentioned, the continent of Europe the foundation of re Renaissance and the birthplace of the ideals of liberty, equality, and fraternity, where the worst crimes of physical extermination of uh, groups took place. It was to be the atrocities committed by the Nazi regime against the Polish population and other weaker and vulnerable groups that led to the wholesale recognition and acceptance of the crime of physical extermination of groups into the realm of international criminal law. In contemporary terms, this activity of physical extermination of groups is labeled as genocide. Raphael Lampkin, a Polish jurist of Jewish origin, is credited with developing the modern principles relating to the crime of genocide and indeed uh, with the coining of the term itself. In 1933, he presented his ideas based on the protection of groups in a special report to the Fifth International Conference for the Unification of Penal Law. He later elaborated these ideas in his work entitled Access Rule in Occupied Europe to develop the term genocide, which was derived partly from the Greek word genos, meaning race, tribe, or nation, and partly from the Latin verb side, which denotes the act of killing. Lamkin not only envisaged immediate physical destruction of a nation or a group, 
but considered genocide, and here I quote him, to signify coordinated plan of different actions aiming at the destruction of essential foundations of life of national group. The objective of such plan being disintegration of the political and social institutions of culture, language, national feelings, religion, and the economical existence of national groups, and the destruction of personal security, liberty, health, dignity, and even the lives of individuals belonging to such groups. Now, this was a broader holistic understanding of genocide. And this holistic understanding of the concept is reflected, and as Pete has already mentioned, is reflected in the United Nations General Assembly resolution on the crime of genocide and adopted by a unanimous vote by the, by the newly established General Assembly in its first session. The preeminence of, re of this resolution is manifested by its adoption on the 11th of December 1946, two years before the famous General Assembly resolution, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, now known as the, also known as the Magna Carta of All Mankind, which was adopted on the 10th of December 1948. The resolution on the crime of genocide, as a General Assembly resolution, was prima facie deprived of the status of creating binding legal obligations. Nevertheless, the unanimity of the Assembly in declaring, and I quote there, genocide as a crime under international law, which the civilized world condemns. And the substance and the form of the resolution leads us to conviction that it was, in fact, declaratory of customary international law. Now, if the resolution was indeed declaratory of customary law and binding upon all states, the, subs the subsequent convention that was adopted, and again, this was mentioned here earlier, uh, the, the convention adopted in 1948, the Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide, represents a narrower and limited understanding of the crime of genocide with evident lacony in its implementation. I will not examine the substantive definitional limitations within the Genocide Convention this evening, save to say that these limitations have generated significant uncertainty in the development of the concept since 1948. That said, it is important to acknowledge that the Genocide Convention, for all its limitations, has been part of the architecture of international criminal law and international human rights, and the conventional interpretation of acts constituting genocide have been pretty much followed by all subsequent international instruments. This definitional approach is reflected and reinforced in the statutes of the International Criminal Tribunal for Yugoslavia, International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda, and more recently, the statute of the International Criminal Court. In light of various genocidal conflicts since the convention uh, came into force in 1951, the practical utility of the convention, particularly in terms of the prevention and punishment aspects, so boldly enumerated in the convention itself, has proven to be largely symbolic. In other words, the issue remains as to whether the convention, apart from its symbolism, has any practical contemporary relevance. Genocidal conflicts, um, certainly of the past 70 years, unfortunately, are too numerous to mention here. Indeed, the Yugoslav and the Rwandan atrocities, including unrestrained genocidal conflicts and the failings in the Genocide Convention prompted the United Nations Security Council to establish ad hoc tribunals using chapter seven powers vested in the council under the UN Charter. The International Criminal Court established since 2002, although a permanent court, nevertheless is treaty-based and therefore reflects the essential consensual spirit of treaty arrangements. The court is also limited in that unlike the Yugoslav and Rwanda tribunals, it is reliant upon the notion of complementarity, where prim prim primacy is accorded to national courts. Clearly, there are arguable reasons for the Genocide Convention's inability in preventing and in punishment those, those who have committed this crime. This highly charged political nature of genocide, the core of our politics, and the political polarization reflected through the use of the veto by the Security Council's permanent members 
are prominent reasons for such inaction. But the convention was also based on certain naive assumptions, as stated in its Article 6, that either the territorial state would provide an appropriate forum, or that an international penal tribunal having jurisdiction would be established. Not, neither the territorial jurisdiction could practically be deployed to punish the perpetrators of genocide, nor an international tribunal with compulsory universal jurisdiction has been established. More recent times have witnessed a partial resuscitation through the processes of the International Criminal Court and through the adjudicative communicative mechanism of the International Court of Justice with the application of Article 9 of the Convention. The later process is evidenced in the cases of the application of the Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide, the judgment being delivered in February 2007, and more recently by the indication of provisional mayors against Myanmar in the case brought by the Gambia, which is the Order on Provisional Mayors 23rd January 2020. Both cases shed important light in determining the ability of the International Court of Justice preventing and punishing genocide. The ICJ Provisional Mayor, Mayor's Order of January 2020 presents interesting possibilities for the future in that this order, the court appears to have established the standing of non-injured states to bring cases seeking to enforce obligations, what we call it as obligations ergo omnes, meaning as the court had established in the earlier case of Barcelona traction case of 1970, obligations of an individual state towards the entire international community. Rejecting Myanmar's allegations that the Gambia was a proxy for the Organization of Islamic Cooperation, also known as the OIC, or acting on behalf of this organization with, with a political intent, the Gambia, a, a non-injured and a non-affected state, was able to satisfy the test of standing against Myanmar in order to seek provisional measures. The provisional measures included in order that Myanmar, and I quote here the, the, from the court itself, that Myanmar takes all measures within its powers to prevent the commission of all acts within the scope of Article 2 of the Genocide Convention in relation to the Rohingya group within its territory and an order for Myanmar ensure that its military and any irregular armed units and inter alia any person subject to its control not commit acts within the scope of Article 2 and 3 of the Genocide Convention. The provisional measures also place the requirement for Myanmar to report back to the court, and here I quote again, on all measures taken to give effect to the order within four months and every six months thereafter until a final decision in the case, with the Gambia having the opportunity to submit to the court its own comments. A decision uh, on the merits of this case is likely to take some time, uh, perhaps some years, but at least there is optimism that, that it, there is some movement towards prevention and possible punishment of those committing the crime of genocide. We wait to see whether this optimism is misplaced or indeed whether there can be justice for the victims of genocide. I thank you. Pro Professor Raymond, that was a very interesting start for this evening and perfect timing, if I may say so. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Um, our, our next um, uh, speaker is uh, Dr. Uh, Noemi Lopien. Um, Noemi, thank you very much unmute myself. Hello, good evening. Thank you, Irene, for inviting me along to this prestigious panel and audience. Indeed, it's an honour to speak to you all tonight. And for those from the UK, I thank you for joining us in our last few hours prior to lockdown. The question that haunts me, and repeatedly so, is how could this industrialised machinery of six million holocausts, six million murders, happen in a civilized society. Not only were most Germans active in this devilish industrialized machinery of death, the rest that weren't active were passive bystanders. Together with their European neighbors, 
who collaborated readily and almost immediately. How could a civilized, educated, cultured society do this? As my father, Dr. Ernst Israel Bornstein says in his book, The Long Night, and I quote, in a century in which animal protection was vigorously promoted and demonstrations against the use of rabbits for vivisection took place. The wheels were apparently silently grinding so that even sensitive ears were not disturbed. Why weren't sensitive ears disturbed? Why did so many join in? It's complicated. And there are multiple explanations. Poor economy, loss of World War I, I think hatred. When Hitler came to power in 1933, immediately he declared the national boycott of Jewish businesses. In April of the same year, he passed the law for the restoration of the professional civil service. This meant that legal professionals and civil servants of the Jewish faith were no longer allowed to work. He removed those that worked within government and the law. They could no longer help others nor protect themselves. In 1935, the infamous Nuremberg laws were implemented. They forbade marriage and extramarital affairs between Jewish and non-Jewish German citizens, as well as the employment of German women under the age of 45 in Jewish households. Laws, I don't have to tell this learned audience, are made to protect us human beings and form part of a civilized society. When that breaks, we lose part of our civilized society. Where did this innate hatred come from? And why does it still exist to this very day? Antisemitism, the hatred of Jews, has existed throughout the ages. In the Middle Ages, the hate was because of religion. In my parents' epoch, the Nazis harmed my parents and murdered their families simply because they were born Jewish. And today, we're demonized because of our nation state. The far left used the image and propaganda as the, of the Jew as the capitalist. And some, like Corbyn, formed allegiance with the Islamist extremists like Hamas and Hezbollah, wanting to extinguish our nation state and the Jewish people at large. So you see, for me, it's still very much part of my life, a threat to me, my family, and my community. Before Corona, I feel that in the world there has already been a general unrest, a rise in populism, a lack of solid leadership, clarity and stability not visible, and economic uncertainty leading to a people divided, removed and disconnected from their politicians, from their work and from their communities. This isolation causes discontent and people search to follow. We're not made to live alone. We're part always of a herd and seek that herd. And so social media platforms have become increasingly popular and as useful as they are, as we see here tonight, equally they're used massively for negative propaganda and hate speech. Since Corona too, many more people have experienced isolation and loneliness and in particular our young. Hannah Arendt, already in the 1950s, described in her book, The Origins of Totalitarianism, a link between loneliness and the politics of intolerance. It is through surrendering their individual selves to ideology that they rediscover their purpose and self-respect. And in part, I think that's an explanation for joining parties like the Nazi parties or other movements of extremisms that give promises. As you can perhaps hear from my accent, I grew up in Munich in Germany till the age of 13, oblivious to the fact that my dad as a teen was incarcerated in seven labor and concentration camps, including five transit camps over four and a half years. 
oblivious to the fact that my mum, as a little girl of 10, was questioned at gunpoint by the Gestapo, two Nazi officers. I loved Munich, and that's credit to my parents. I had a very happy childhood. After the war, my father studied medicine and dentistry and made it his life's mission to help people, not only professionally, but also communally. He was a very warm, loving, giving person, and till he died, he was the rock of our family. My mom was very protective of my dad. I didn't really understand why. I grew up with an unspoken sense of not being allowed to draw attention to myself and ideally to disappear. We also would never volunteer or speak publicly about our Jewishness, be it in the schools or the streets, although my close school friends, of course, knew that I wasn't Jewish. That I was Jewish, sorry. I knew that my father had written a book but didn't read or acknowledge what had happened to him and his family, my family, till after the birth of my fourth child. I was quite, I was 36 then, so a mature adult, and I'd waited that long. Oh gosh, I'm missing a... Sorry, bear with me one second, I'm missing a page of my talk. Um, I apologise. Don't worry, Naomi. I'm Take sorry. Time. Take time. Clearly, if we talk about the Majazir that happened in history, this is a conversation. It's a little bit more than that. I had a, I had, after having read the book, I had a choice of closing the book on its last page and ignore what had happened to my father, his parents, my grandparents, my young 15 year old aunt Noemi, whose name I bear, and my younger uncle of 11, Judah, who were all murdered in Auschwitz in 1943. Could I ignore the murder of my family? my grandparents, my uncle, my aunt, my wider family, great grandparents, great aunts. Would I partake in making the voiceless, voiceless once more? I couldn't. My dad was encouraged by his professor of psychiatry and neurology to write his experiences like an eyewitness reportage, as he says, and I quote, from free literary embellishment. During this, his, this time of writing, he was tormented by nightmares. He wrote it so the world should know the truth. Although he never told me I was 12 when he died, nor did my mum, I felt that I did need to tell the world the truth. He, I felt, had written it for you. So I translated the book. It took me three years together, as you'll see, with David Arnold. He didn't speak any German, and he didn't have my, I found out, my father's language. But what he gave me was discipline to do it every week, because I'm ashamed to say I didn't feel like it, even in the comfort of my home, because it was grueling. And he also created a time's distance when things were extremely difficult. And so I'm grateful to him for that. Let me share at this point an introductory passage with you. And so you can hear my father's words. After so many years, can one now relate events, thoughts and feelings as one saw, thought and felt them? Probably not. How does a person feel when walking? He sees his companion being shot the moment he stops walking 
and realises he can barely walk himself. Of course, but first he carries on. He wants to live. He reaches for his companion's hand to support himself. But the companion himself is at the end of his strength. He pushes the hand away. He won't support the laggard. The weak one is left behind. But that one must have seen for oneself the lifeless face, the flickering eyes of a person about to confront his fate. The bullet strikes his neighbor, and soon he will also be struck. Who can say what such a person experiences whilst walking the final steps of his life? Who can describe what he feels and suffers in these moments? And what did I myself experience on this day? As chosen inmate, I had to carry the bread sack for the capo. And as the last one in line, I had to march next to him in the SS man. The SS man shocked all who stopped and the capo had to record their concentration camp numbers. I looked into the barrel of the gun before the bullet struck the neck of the tottering person, looked at the thin stream of blood that ran slowly as life departed the body. I observed the SS man and saw how he ate his sandwich with appetite whilst continuing to walk despite his bloody deed. In the nearby fields, there were farmers sowing and at one of the houses by the roadside, a woman was watering flowers. In this moment, a bullet pierced the head of a straggler. A small stream of blood ran down the temple. And all that happened in the midst of built up fields and lovingly tender, tended flower gardens. Are we still living in this world or was all this a nasty, unending nightmare? How was it possible that people within 50 meters were quietly going to work whilst in their midst, exhausted, defenseless people were being shot? My mum never told my dad her own story. He died without knowing that my mum was questioned at the age of 10 by two Gestapo officers with a gun pointed to her head. I tell mum that I feel that human suffering is incomparable. Myself, I only found out my mum's story nine years ago. My mum is French and she was sent away by her parents, which was an extremely difficult decision, in 1944, together with her older sister, Helen, who was 13, and her younger brother, Joey, aged nine. With various group leaders um, from the southwest of France to the safety of Switzerland. On the way, they were arrested by Gestapo with sniffer dogs, and they were imprisoned in Anmas, which exists today, which is the French border town to Geneva. Gustavo Meyer repeatedly asked daily the questioning, are your parents Jewish? Are you Jewish? What's your name? What's your parents' name? Where do they live? They wanted the children to tell their parents' whereabouts and addresses. The children never did. My mum said in part, it wasn't courage. She was so frozen that she couldn't speak during these interrogations. Today, when I hear mom on rare occasions tell her own story, she keeps interjecting. It doesn't make sense. How could this happen? Only happened because we were Jewish. I end with a line from my dad in the long night when he says how he felt being liberated. We were solitary islands in the freezing foreign world. Please, Today, let us not be that world. Thank you. Naomi, thank you very much indeed for that. Um, it, it's incredibly powerful uh, personal legacy, which um, I think greatly advances the discussion. Thank you very much indeed. Um, Leila, Do Dr. Leila Furman, um, uh, can I invite you now to um, uh, say your uh, have your uh, time. Thank you. 
Well, uh, first of all, uh, thank you for inviting me to this seminar, to this webinar, especially thank you, Arif. Um, I'm very glad to be with you tonight. Well, I'm a Yezidi by myself. I grew up in uh, Germany, um, but my parents came My parents came in the late 60s um, from um, the Kurdish parts of Turkey called Kurdistan uh, to Germany, and um, they couldn't return to the homeland because of the political and uh, social circumstances there. And um, well, I would like to share with you um, the, my experience and my observation concerning the Yezidi genocide. The Yazidi genocide began on the 3rd of August 2014 with the attacks of so-called uh, Islamic State in Sinjar area in Iraq, where within a few hours almost 400,000 people became uh, IDPs and later refugees. More than 6,000 women and children have been held in captivity. And the meanwhile, around th uh, 3,500 women and children are back on their families. Around 4,000 people are still missed. Um, in general, IS um, killed directly men uh, in Sinjar and women and children were held in captivity. And there are still dozens of mass graves in Sinjar area today. And people are looking for the bones of their family members. Well, um, I would like to divide my personal reflections on Yezidi genocide in different parts. Um, first, I would like to share with you my experience in refugee camps in Turkey and Syria and in IDP camps in Iraq. The first time when I entered uh, a refugee camp in Turkey, there was a big silence. It seemed that the people, um, the Yazidis there were somehow broken. They felt broken. Um, they had been um, on Sinjar mountain surrounded by IS for seven days. They didn't know um, if they will be killed. Um, there was no water and no food in the hot summer. Uh, in, in Sinjar, um, pilgrim places have been destroyed by IS. Um, in front of their eyes, family members have been killed. Um, I mean, the situation also on the morning of the 3rd of August was awful because the people were expecting that the Kurdish armed forces who were based in Sinjar area will, will protect them. But um, suddenly they also, uh, they escaped or they had to escape also um, um, neighbors, Arabic neighbors who were very close friends also of Yezidis uh, joined IS and um, the Yezidis uh, didn't expect something like that because they were thinking that they are, they are not organized, there are no political actor in the field, so they won't be targeted by anyone. So um, this was a very big shock. Um, only after a few weeks, um, and the Yezidis began to complain, for instance, about living conditions in the camps and argued also with, uh, with responsible persons in the camp. In fact, we were a bit glad about it because we realized that somehow they, they had overcome um, the, the first shock. Most of the Yezidis in the camp didn't know where to go and how to get away from this region. They wanted to get um, to a safe country like Germany, and they also took very danger, dangerous ways also to get there. There was no ma um, uh, maintenance of social roles of men and women. There was no work, uh, no salary, um, especially men couldn't, couldn't, um, yes, couldn't contribute to, um, to the family with the salary. Um, in fact, men couldn't um, protect the women and also um, their families. And as a result, there were also cases of violence against women and children by male members of, of their families. Young lovers, they decided just to run away together because they were afraid that they will lose each other because the families uh, decided uh, from, from one day to, uh, to the next day where to go. There was always in the camps an atmosphere of departure. So uh, no one wanted to stay in the camps. And um, so it was sometimes also difficult to support them, difficult to make them satisfied or sometimes even difficult to talk to them. I remember the case of Narin. Uh, she was a small girl from Sinjar. Um, she was in a refugee camp in Turkey. And um, she has been run over um, by a car uh, close to the refugee camp where her family lived. It was the first time, um, to be honest, that I saw a dead body. Uh, I helped to take her, her in and her corpse was later transferred to Sinjar. 
This girl survived um, seven days at Sinjar Mountain. So she has also been um, surrounded by IS for seven days, uh, living in, in fear. Um, she has been rescued by um, Kurds from Rojava, who organized a corridor to Syria, who also gave uh, their life. Um, she survived the dangerous crossing of the Iraqi-Turkish border. And finally, she died in Turkey. I remember that the responsible persons at the refugee camp were very much concerned. They were saying they were failing to protect this girl after others even gave their, their life to protect her. And um, there were permanent efforts of the Yazidis to get in touch with enslaved relatives. Um, they, they were trying to get in touch with people who could get in touch with IS members or with businessmen whom they know they were somehow in the, in the, in the region where, where IS was, was based. They collected money, most as a loan, to buy their enslaved relatives back. The youth lost years at school or university. Children um, were for years not attending any formal recognized school. Then I would like to share with you my experience with enslaved women. Uh, a few months after the beginning of the genocide, uh, I was based uh, in, in Mardin. Um, we uh, learned that there's a group of um, women who could somehow escape from IS captivity and that they will cross the border to Turkey. So me and a few colleagues of mine, uh, professionals like doctors and, uh, and lawyers and others, um, we were caring of this group of, of women. To be honest, I was very, very ex excited. I was thinking we are anyway, we are strong and we have to be strong and there will be very weak women we will, we will meet. And the situation was quite the opposite. I was totally impressed how strong these women were. Um, um, how much they also wanted to survive, especially in captivity, how much they were believing in, in their families and in their identity also, and how much they wanted us to struggle for, for justice. So um, the women uh, wanted to get back to the families, of course, as soon as possible. And um, they were always mentioning that uh, we have to do something to, uh, to help the women who are still, still have held in captivity by, by IS. And they were always thinking of um, other family members who are, who are missed since this, uh, this genocide. But after being back in their families, uh, the extent of the trauma became uh, more obvious in different dimensions. On the one hand, uh, there's a trauma of an individual, that means a trauma of a woman. And then uh, there's a trauma of a woman uh, being part of a family. And then there is um, a trauma of women being part as a um, being part of a society, and the lack of the professional support of these women and their families is until today a very big challenge. And also, it seems uh, to be denied to look at these women as a group, um, as a group of women, and also as a group of Yazidis. Although they are always mentioning that this didn't only happen to them as a person, but because they belong to the group of women and because they belong to the group of Yazidis. This has, of course, to do uh, with, the, with power ar arrangements in the field and, um, and the dominance of men and non-Yazidis, not only in the region, but also uh, especially in the region. But there are also very strong women uh, from the very beginning uh, who uh, are saying they want to struggle for justice. Um, they speak with journalists, they organize public events, and they are writing books in general, they are supported by Yezidi men who welcome them back and their families. But they are still very, very much um, formal challenges like getting new ID cards and other documents, especially when the husband or the father is still missed. So there's also um, no, no support also for, for this woman. And what uh, happened to the children who are born due to rapings? The Yezidi community don't accept these children. And while some mothers, they don't want, uh, they would like to leave this, uh, their children and others, they would like to live with them. But there's, there are no possibilities in the field for mothers uh, to be together with their, uh, with their children. Um, third, I would like to share with you my observations and experience um, in the new Sinjar. Um, the first time when I traveled to Sanjay, this was end of 2014, um, there was almost no one. There were especially people who were fighting against IS and uh, just a few families. 
And during that time, I really, I couldn't imagine that there will be a time that people will go, ba go back because especially in the camps, everyone was saying that they will never, never, ever go back uh, to Sinjar again uh, because there is uh, a, a black area for them. But today, um, more than 100,000 Yazidis moved back to Sinjar. I still meet women uh, who still feel not safe in Sinjar because of Turkish airstrikes and uh, missing political recognition from Baghdad um, for the area. They miss, of course, their family members. They miss um, their former lives. Um, and they also have no idea for the, for the future. There's a huge number of trauma women uh, who don't get any kind of support in Sinjar because it seems that no one no one uh, would like to to support the rebuilding process in Sinjar but they are also organized and very strong women for the first time in history uh, the the Yidi, the Yizidis at all are organized and for the first time in history especially Yizidi women are organized there's the Yezidi, uh, Yezidi Women's Council, for instance, in, in Sinjar, the Yezidi Women's Foundation, which is re uh, registered in Iraq. And by the way, uh, we learned that it is the first association in Iraq, uh, which is um, not only caring of women, but uh, which is even run by women. So, um, of course, we were also more than proud uh, to, to, to learn it that uh, either the women seem to be, seem, or the, the association seems to be the strongest in Iraq um, concerning the um, yeah, women. And there's an, also an Yezidi armed forces uh, today. Um, these women are the picture of a new Sinjar where women try to get uh, a role in decision making processes and to become an actor in family and also in society. Parents are deciding, for instance, to bring their children to a first kindergarten in Sinjar um, because the women are traumatized and they would like to relieve them or a mother has found a job and they don't know where to bring their children. So uh, women uh, want to learn, they want to go to school and they want to have a job, but due to less of possibilities, this is still a challenge. And um, there is also a um, unification process of the Yezidis. So this is also the first time in history that Yezidis not only are organized, but they try to come together as a community. And uh, also for the first time, there are also protests, for instance, also in Sinjar, um, a public protest when it comes to political uh, aspects or for instance, also um, there is a new agreement between Kurds and Arabs on Sinjar and which was which has been signed and backed it, but um, no one asked the Yezidis in the field in the field if they would agree on it or what they think about this kind of agreement. And this is something the Yezidis won't um, accept in, uh, in in these days because they are saying uh, we are experiencing uh, a genocide and we don't want uh, anyone to rule um, uh, rule about about us and on Sinjar. And then finally, I would like to share with you my very personal experience. So one week before the genocide began, I decided to move to Mardin, which is uh, an area in the, Kurdish, in the Kurdish part of Turkey. My parents are from there and I felt in love with the um, homeland of my parents. I traveled there a lot for years. Um, and after finishing my PhD here in Germany, I decided uh, to work there. I um, to, to work there as an advisor of Mardin Met Metropolitan Municipality. So my plan was to go there to work there um, to be part of the new improvements in the field, especially um, and, uh, concerning the Kurdish question. And then to travel uh, each weekend, I wanted to travel around to explore the beautiful places uh, in this region. But of course, with the beginning of the genocide, everything changed. My engagement went without any saying because I was Yezidi and I was a woman. So before the, the genocide began, uh, to be honest, I was, when I was asked, I mean, about my identity, I was always saying I'm Kurdish and I'm German. But um, these days, uh, I say that I'm at the same level. I'm also Yezidi and I'm also woman. So when I think about it, it seems that uh, to belong to a group which is a danger makes this identity obviously stronger. And um, yes, I would also share with you um, another issue. It, um, there was a public holiday in Turkey 
And um, I decided to go to Sejar because, of course, whenever I had the time and the possibility to travel there, I was traveling there to meet family members and to meet friends. And uh, my um, friends were going to the sea and enjoying somewhere else. And I decided, of course, to go to Sinjar. I took, again, the difficult and sometimes also dangerous way to get there. And at one evening, uh, I was sitting at the top of uh, Sinjar mountain. Uh, I was visiting a family. We were drinking tea. And it uh, was already dark because it was in the evening and there was no electricity. Electricity and the people, I mean, the family I was visiting was uh, living in tents there. So we couldn't see each other because it was dark already and there was no light. We were drinking our tea and suddenly there were um, fighter jets flying across our heads uh, and in front of our eyes. So we were sitting at the top of the mountain looking to the southern part of Sinjar, which was still op uh, occupied by IS. And the uh, fighter jets were bombing IS positions in the southern part of Sinjar. And while the family members um, were explaining me uh, which areas um, they are bombing, I was really feeling like in a film. I mean, I grew up in Germany. It was the first time for me, like being in an area of war. And I was just uh, thinking of my friends who, who were at the sea and enjoying somewhere else. And I was in my, holiday, in my holiday voluntarily in an area of war. So this was really like being in a, in, in a film for me. But in fact, traveling to Sinjar and um, to Iraq, uh, to Syria, and of course also to Turkey was something very normal for me. Of course, it was not uh, always safe. Um, but despite um, of uh, insecurity, I somehow felt very safe being with my own people. But I have also to mention, of course, uh, I was mostly um, traveling in Kurdish areas and I felt very strong as a woman, um, as, an, as a Yezidi, but also because I'm a German citizen. So these three identities made me very strong uh, in the field. And finally, I would like to share with you the case of my father. My father was the most important uh, Yezidi leader. He was not the only Yezidi leader, but he was, especially after the beginning of the last genocide, the most important Yezidi leader. And he became a symbol of the new and united Yezidi community. He gave strength to the people, had very good connections to all uh, actors in the field and also to non-Yezidis. Uh, he supported the building of bodies of self-determination of Yezidis in Sinjar. His dream was that, that Yezidis decide by themselves about their life and their future without foreign determination, as this seems to be the reason why they couldn't protect themselves when they were attacked by IS, because they were always looking for others to protect them, and they were also not organized. Um, my father has been targeted by Turkey, uh, because of his strength and his success, and he has been killed by a Turkish airstrike after he attended an anniversary event in the village of Kocho. Um, you might maybe know this in the name of the village. Um, it is the village of Nadia Murat. Um, on the 15th of August 2014, IS um, has killed all men of this woman, and all women of this um, village have been held in captivity. Well, my father's death was, in fact, not only for me and my family a very big lose, but um, it was a very big lose for the whole community. Today, you can see his pictures in many homes, um, at public places, and many children also got his name. And it seems that the graveyard where he and others, other men and women, uh, who gave their life for a safe and a strong uh, future of Yazidis and for a new Sinjar become, uh, become like a pilgrim place. And in fact, almost all pilgrim places in Sinjar are places to honor people who protected Yezidis or who served for their own community. What I can say is that my father made me learn first to be a human. The case of my father is not the only case. Um, there are also other cases where uh, Yezidi leaders since the beginning of the genocide has been targeted in different ways. They have been threatened, arrested, and also killed. So in the last weeks, for instance, there were again two other cases 
Uh, one uh, was the, the case of a, a Yezidi journalist who was very critical about the Kurdish authorities, but also a, um, a very um, famous um, Yezidi businessman who has also suddenly been killed uh, on, the, on the street. Yes, I would like to end um, with an observation um, concerning the Yezidi woman and the Yezidi uh, community. Well, I think that not only IS, um, but also regional and national authorities, and maybe also actors in third uh, states, um, were thinking that the Yezidis um, are the weakest, um, that the women, especially the Yezidi women, will be the weakest. But by welcoming back um, the Yezidi women uh, from captivity and by struggling for justice and um, by, um, yes, by struggling for a new uh, future, for a new future for uh, Sanjar, it seems to be that those who were supposed to be the weakest became finally the strongest. And this is for me, for me the biggest motiva motivation uh, to, to move on to struggle for justice. Thank you. Leila, thank you very much indeed for uh, an incredibly powerful uh, and personal legacy like Noemi's. Um, and can I say, ending on a, a note of hope, um, we're talking about anniversaries tonight, uh, as well as law, um, with the Holocaust and Srebrenica, but your uh, account brings this completely up to date uh, and reminds us all that, of course, what we're talking about uh, isn't simply historic. Thank you very much. Uh, next, we have um, Arif Abraham, who um, many of you will know. Uh, he's the convener of our international team, and we're going to turn back to matters of law. Um, so, Arif. Thank you very much, Pete. Um, what I'd like to do with my um, 10 minutes of time is, is really transition the discussion back to the law, because when we talk about the law, of course, we are concerned with ideas of justice, of accountability, of redress, and ending what we hope is impunity. And we've heard from Leila that even today in, in 2020, we constantly grapple with the issue of genocide and the commission of acts of genocide. But the question I would like to ask is both very simple and paradoxically very complicated. And, and that question is, what is genocide as a crime? Um, now, there are two aspects to that question. Um, the first is the formal definition of genocide, which Pete and uh, Javed had alluded to earlier, and that's set out in the Genocide Convention. And as uh, Javed mentioned, it's been mirrored in numerous international treaties, statutes, and domestic legislation. And then the second aspect is looking at what is the challenge of applying this definition in practice? Now, it's worth restating the formal definition of genocide, and that is the commission of prohibited acts with an intent to destroy in whole or in part protected groups as such. Now, just reciting that definition, you'll appreciate it. It's complicated. Each and every single word is relevant to the question and the elements of the crime. The way I see it is there are essentially four aspects critical aspects to this definition. The first is the prohibited acts. Now, there are only five prohibited acts of genocide. Those are uh, killings, the causing of serious bodily or mental harm, creating conditions of life calculated to kill. Fourth, uh, imposing measures intended to restrict births. And fifth is the transfer of children from one group to another. There are no other prohibited acts of genocide. Now, a frequent um, misunderstanding is that other culpable acts, as they are known in the jurisprudence, i.e. other types of international crimes, are acts of genocide. So, for instance, you have a body of crimes that are called war crimes that apply in context of armed conflict. And then you have a whole body of crimes. Roughly, there are about 11 crimes against humanity. Now, a frequent crime against humanity is the, it are two, uh, two that frequently occur in conflict, which are forcible transfer and deportation of people. Now, often 
those crimes are mistaken as genocide lacks. And as I've said, it's not an act of genocide. However, the story doesn't end there because um, what a perpetrator could do is they can carry out, for instance, an act of forcible transfer. Essentially, you take a group of people, you push them elsewhere, so you take over that territory or land or resources. However, whilst that's not an act of genocide, if you do that in a way that, for instance, um, is calculated to um, restrict births in a particular group of people, so for instance, you might kill the men and the children, and you may transfer the women to another part of the country. Now, of course, that makes, if that is done for the purpose of restricting births within the group, then you start going into the genocidal territory. So you have the five acts, but there, are, there is a context around these five prohibited acts. The second aspect of the definition that, that concerns us is the protected group. Now, what makes genocide unique as a crime is that it's not just concerned with a perpetrator targeting an individual. It's a perpetrator targeting the group to which the individual belongs. And that is the distinction that, uh, that essentially separates out the crime of genocide from all other crimes. Now you may well ask, well, who are the, who is and what constitutes a protected group? And again, it's quite an exhaustive criteria in, in the jurisprudence and in the definition. There are only four protected groups, national, religious, ethnic, or racial groups. There are no other groups which are protected by the genocide convention. So if you are a political group, if you are a social group, if you are a cultural association, you simply do not have protection under the genocide convention. Now, again, that raises a complicated question is, well, why aren't these groups protected? And the reason, of course, is that states were the drafters and the signatories to the genocide convention. And there are probably two primary reasons, although there's a lot of academic debate around this, for why these additional groups weren't protected. Political groups partly weren't protected because, of course, many signatories who had empires, who had who were furthering ideological programs, routinely wiped out political opposition groups. Of course, they didn't want to be, um, uh, be the target of any uh, future uh, convention, which obviously might prescribe acts that they had previously committed or were to commit at the time or in future. And then there's an inherent problem with groups as it is. So how would you, for instance, define a cultural association? How long would you have to be a cultural association to become a group? Would you need to have a membership criteria? Um, but just as, just as difficult it is to define a group that's political or cultural, of course, it's, it's just as difficult to do that with national, racial, or religious groups. Sociologists and, and, and anthropologists will know about the term imagined communities and, and therefore even when it comes to national, racial, religious, or ethnic groups, there's a whole body of case law that provides criteria. One of which, for instance, is that a group needs to be positive, identifiable, and distinguishable. It can't be a negatively defined group. So that's the second hurdle when we're talking about the definition of genocide. The third and perhaps the most critical um, uh, aspect of genocide is that genocide is a crime of double intent. So you, for instance, let's say you have an act of killing. The killing must be intentional. Essentially, it's an act of murder. But in order to constitute genocide, the perpetrator not only must intentionally kill someone, but they must do it with an intent to destroy in whole or in part the group. What does destruction mean? The jurisprudence says destruction is physical or biological destruction. It cannot mean anything else. It cannot mean the erasure of an identity. It cannot mean the cultural erasure of a group. It has to be physical or biological destruction. And you may well ask, well, how do you ever, how do you ever get to proving beyond reasonable doubt that the intent was to destroy in whole or in part a group? And of course, the challenge is very rarely would you ever find a perpetrator saying, I'm about to kill this person because I want to commit genocide, or I will put all these people in a particular camp 
and I will create conditions calculated to destroy, you'll, you'll rarely find that with statements stating that they wish to physically or biologically destroy the group. And therefore, what lawyers, investigators, um, researchers do is they look for what in the jurisprudence we call the surrounding facts and circumstances around genocide lacks. So essentially you look at the pattern of crimes, you look at who's committing the crimes, are these low level perpetrators, mid level perpetrators or high level perpetrators? What is the pattern in which the crime is committed? How many people have been affected? Were all of them affected or only some of them? And what were, if any, the statements and behavior and practices of these perpetrators when carrying out these genocidal acts? And of course, you'll appreciate that trying to prove that the surrounding facts and circumstances allow an inference of an intent to destroy is very difficult to obtain. And the final aspect of the definition is the, is the, is the commission of the act. What do we mean by commission? And essentially, this is a question of responsibility. Genocide has a dual responsibility in the sense that criminal responsibility lies with both individuals and states. Um, there are different types of um, punishable acts under the convention. So you have genocide, you have a conspiracy to commit genocide, you have um, uh, an incitement to genocide, an attempt to commit genocide, or um, complicity with genocide. And the way genocide has often been understood, and indeed it was set out in the Nuremberg judgment um, of 1946, is that international crimes are committed by men, not by abstract entities. And therefore, when we talk about intent, we are talking about the individual intent of um, natural persons. However, the convention does allow for the fact that you can attribute the acts of individuals to states um, by virtue of fact that an individual may be an official or an organ or an agent of the state and a state may be complicit with a group of individuals carrying out genocide. And that really goes to the heart of the convention that it's a convention about prevention and punishment and states have these duties to prevent and punish and not commit genocide. Now, finally, you might wonder, well, why is all this technical detail really necessary? Uh, and the reason it's necessary is that there is often a big gap in understanding between what the public understands genocide to mean and how the crime of genocide is applied and interpreted by courts. Now, the gap wouldn't matter ordinarily. However, bridging the gap is important because uh, as, as um, Noemi and Leila and Javed have, have identified, um, essentially what you have is a contestation over the term and a lot turns on the outcome of that contestation. For instance, should we apply the term genocide to historic events that occurred before 1948 and before you had the crime of genocide? Um, should we apply the term genocide to a situation in a country that's utterly horrific but for instance, may not meet the test of genocide, but labeling it genocide might allow attention to be attracted to the concept and the, to, to the actual situation to have it redressed. And then finally, in the absence of any accountability or justice mechanisms that allow for a determination, who is to define whether a particular situation in a country is genocide or not? These are all important questions which require answers I'm afraid I've run out of time, so I'm unable to answer those questions. And um, hopefully I can pass, it, pass the baton back on to Pete and, and Kate to try and attempt to at least um, uh, start to unpack these questions. But of course, we do have some, um, some time and some space for discussions and perhaps we can address them there. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Arif, for um, provoking and interesting thoughts. Um, and as I've got the chair, I can abuse that position and pass the baton on without, um, without answering any of those points. Kate. Thanks. Can you hear me okay? Um, thanks for that. And um, thank you to all the speakers so far as well. Um, and to everybody who's who's listening. Um, I'm going to, as uh, Arif has suggested, uh, pick up the baton 
um, and talk again a little bit more about um, some of the legal aspects of genocide. And in particular, I'm going to look at the avenues and challenges in the legal struggle against impunity and uh, towards accountability. So what some of those mechanisms might be and uh, what the challenges um, are that might face those who are seeking to take advantage of those uh, mechanisms. Um, and picking up on, on Arif's point about um, the contested meaning or the tension um, between what is what, the, what might commonly be understood as genocide um, and what that legal, uh, quite uh, precise legal definition um, really is. Um, that, that brings to mind this question of um, hierarchies within international crimes. And so the, the legal definition presents this, us with this challenge, even where there is incontrovertibly a terrible atrocity that's taken place. And the question, as Arif has flagged, will be, be asked, is this genocide? And the legal position is um, that it has been reiterated on uh, many times, I think, that there is no hierarchy amongst international crimes. But rhetorically um, and um, it, politically in the common understanding, the crime does possess this particular importance and um, many or multiple panelists tonight have called it the crime of crimes and in fact that was what one of the introductory um, slides today to the to this session um, called it so there is this issue about um, what the difficulty that survivors will be faced with when they seek to challenge impunity achieve accountability um, they seek a finding often, they may seek a finding of genocide because of this particular power and then face this legal definition um, that they may see, seem, see to be um, particularly restrictive in the ways that Arif has described. So perhaps that's something that we can come back to as Arif has said. In terms of the mechanisms um, for achieving uh, some sort of accountability and challenging impunity. Um, looking at the Genocide Convention itself, again, Arif has flagged the obligations, the key obligations in Article 1 of the Convention are to prevent and punish gen genocide. And so um, how should states do this? Um, and how do individuals, victims, hold them to account for those obligations under the convention. Um, the first, in terms of prevention, um, taking that as the, sort of the logical starting point, there isn't anything particularly prescriptive in the convention apart from the um, provision that states parties may call upon UN organs to take action under the charter. So that's article eight of the, the convention. Um, and there is also uh, established a UN office for the prevention of genocide and the responsibility to protect. So there's that organization which looks to, um, as part of its own remit to the prevention of genocide. Um, part of that, of course, involves investigation into situations which may be um, incipient genocide or may already um, fulfill those criteria. Um, and that's, that's, that is done by way of its um, early warning work. But obviously there are many other mechanisms by which investigations take place, both formal and informal, um, at an NGO level, for example, and amongst survivors and, and, and victims themselves. Also, um, and I'll come back to this, uh, there are obviously provisions or mechanisms for ICC investigations uh, where, where the criminal court is involved. Um, but the Genocide Convention, to come on to the punishment um, aspect of, of matters, it supposes the punishment of persons, and this goes back to what Arif was saying about um, the notion of criminal responsibility and the definition of genocide as a crime. Uh, the Convention uh, supposes or presupposes this notion of individual criminal responsibility and says um, it, it it specifies that um, persons shall be tried by a competent tribunal of the state where the, 
the particular act was committed or a competent international penal tribunal. That's, that were the, those were the terms used in the 1948 uh, convention. At that stage, there wasn't a competent um, international tribunal, which I think Professor Raymond um, alluded to. Um, and, but that there is this duality, which supposes a trial at domestic level, but also at international level. So one of the mechanisms we might see under the convention would be um, trial at, uh, in domestic law. But for the reasons I think Professor Raymond alluded to earlier, this is um, something that remains relatively unlikely um, for various reasons. Um, and so I think the, the focus has always been on international criminal responsibility, and that's what I want to focus on here. But also, it's right to just note um, the possibility of trial um, irrespective of the location of um, the perpetrator or where the act took place under the concept of universal jurisdiction, which is available because of the gravity of the crime of genocide, um, which allows for prosecution by any state in domestic courts subject to the domestic um, law of that that state. Um, the reality again here is that these sorts of prosecutions, whilst uh, the mechanism is potentially available, they're pretty far, few and far between. Uh, they raise all sorts of practical difficulties in terms of investigations, um, achieving attendance of witnesses and so on and so forth. But that is a mechanism that is um, sometimes used to bring um, perpetrators to account for genocides. It's something that we, sh we shouldn't forget. Just moving on to the international criminal level, um, I've already said that there wasn't a tribunal established under the Genocide Convention per se, albeit that there was provision for one. In the 1990s, as Professor Raymond's um, outlined, we saw the establishment of the um, Criminal Tribunal for, for the former U Yugoslavia and for Rwanda. And they um, had jurisdiction um, over the crime of genocide, and that, that's where a lot of the jurisprudence comes from. Um, that we now move on to um, the International Criminal Court, and it's there that we really see um, the issue of criminal responsibility at a personal level for genocide. Looking at the, the challenges, I think this is the mechanism, ICC prosecution. Um, we need to then look at what the challenges might be in respect of achieving accountability through, through the criminal, International Criminal Court. Um, first of all, we know there are jurisdictional issues here. So um, the ICC has jurisdiction over crimes committed by a state party national in the territory of a state party or by in a state that's accepted the jurisdiction of the court, or there's provision for referral um, by the UN Security Council. Um, immediately, we can see that there are potential issues, potential gaps in accountability there, because not every state by any means is a member of the ICC and therefore subject to its jurisdiction. We also have these political considerations which come into play. And again, I think Professor Raymond mentioned this um, in his opening remarks about um, referrals from the Security Council. This, this is um, a politicized process, especially because we have of the veto on the part of any member of the Permanent Five of the Security Council. So all of those things um, create um, challenges and obstacles potentially to accountability through the jurisdiction of the ICC. We also, um, we've also noted that it's, this is supposed to be a complementary mechanism or there's this, this principle of complementarity, uh, which means that the ICC is, is supposed only to prosecute where the relevant state party um, is unwilling or unable to do so. So again, um, that's a jurisdictional issue which, which comes into play. I think it's also right to note that there is no police force or enforcement body associated with the ICC. And so there is um, reliance on the cooperation of states and countries worldwide for its operation. And we can see how that plays out um, in the 
the restriction on the ability of the court really to to take um, control of situations or to take to take um, take on investigations into situations. Um, there is a resource issue here more generally. Um, so that's those are some challenges in, in respect of ICC uh, prosecutions. I think it's important to note though that there is a possibility under the ICC statute um, for reparations for victims as well under under the proceedings of, of the criminal court. So we've got criminal responsibility, but there is also there are also some mechanisms for the involvement of victims and survivors, including uh, the possible avenue for reparations. The other mechanism um, for accountability, and I'll be very brief on this, um, is another one to which Professor Raymond's already um, alluded in his remarks, and that's um, responsibility under the Genocide Convention, um, sorry, state responsibility um, under Article uh, 9 of the Genocide Convention, and that, is, that creates a jurisdiction for the International Court of Justice over disputes um, and matters relating to the interpretation of um, the, the Convention of Genocide. Um, looking at this, um, there are lots of reservations to Article 9 amongst states parties. So some parties say they're not bound by this, um, the ICJ's, ICJ's jurisdiction. Some say they would need express consent to submit to the process. Um, and there, are also, there is also the issue of, I think with all of these mechanisms, the issue of, of, of timeline, delay, and what the impact of delay and um, the length of proceedings might have on the ability to, to obtain justice for survivors and victims. So we can see that the, the Bosnia case um, on, on genocide uh, was, the, the initial application started in 1993 and there was a judgment um, in 2007. So it's a, it's a really long process. Um, and again, this is something that attaches to all of these mechanisms. To try and end on a um, positive note, and I think this again doubles back as I keep doing during this um, presentation to Professor Raymond's remarks. Um, looking at the um, recent provisional measures in the Myanmar case, uh, we can see that they, not only has that opened up space potentially in respect of um, who might take these cases, um, and states taking those cases on an ergo omnes basis. But also there is the provisional measures um, that were granted in that case, give us some, um, some hope that actually the, the timeline issue may not be as, or maybe something that's capable of being addressed through the ICJ's process, because th these measures can be put in place pending resolution of, uh, of the case ultimately. So I think I've gone over time, so I'll stop there. Um, and perhaps lessons for the future is something that we can talk about in the um, breakout sessions and also in the Q&A.